Good morning, Southside Bible Church. A uh, special welcome to anyone who might be visiting. We're glad to have you here as we begin this Advent season as a church. We begin to prepare our hearts uh, to celebrate uh, the coming of our King. Uh, if you hear, can hear that noise, that is the baptismal draining. Okay, that's not, that's not my stomach. <clears throat> so, uh, we have some emergencies as a church to be praying for our, our dear uh, secretary, Jana, uh, and her dad. Um, he's in his 90s. Uh, they're both in the hospital uh, with COVID and pneumonia and some blood clots uh, in Jana's lungs. And so we want to be uh, lifting them up. And Jack, her husband, has come here to worship God uh, in the midst of this trial. And so we pray for our dear brother as well. Rachel and Dan Burke are stuck in Mexico. They were on vacation, and they came down with COVID, and so we pray for them as they're away from home uh, battling this, and just many more. Let's continue to pray for this sweet body. Tom Hunt's mom passed last week, and this week Russ Roars, who's been a member of this church for a long, long time. His mother passed, and Flora and Russ just need our prayers during this season as they have been taking care of her and laboring long and hard to bless her, to uh, escort her into glory. So uh, one quick announcement. I forgot to ask you all the details, but we are going to have a ladies' tea. And so that's coming up. you got one week to register. So don't put it off. Usually you have three weeks. Just get on it. Uh, keep the momentum going from the, the retreat. I encourage you to be a part of that. Anything else that I missed? All right. That's, that's beautiful. Ladies' tea. This morning, we're going to finish up an amazing portion of Scripture that we have been studying through Romans. We have been in Romans 8, 28 through 30 as we're studying through this epistle. And this morning, we're on part four, and we are going to finish that up should the Lord tarry and, and I get through this. Uh, let's read it, Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good. To those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose, what is his purpose? For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that we who would be the firstborn among many brethren, and these whom he predestined, he also called, and these whom he called, he also justified, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. And so we've been looking at what's called the golden chain of God's grace. This is the most comprehensive def definition of God's grace in the Bible in just two verses. And so we've been looking at these different links in this chain of salvation. And here, and I, I was going to pull out the chain, but a lot of you weren't impressed with my chain last week. So <laughs> still, no, oh, it's still here. Well, why not? <laughs> That's the beautiful five links. For new, predestined. Today we're going to look at what was he called, he justified, and he glorified. So we're going to go after the chain this morning. With all, we're going to finish it up. So that's what we'll begin looking at this morning. So here's the outline that we've been following. Paul's given us four elements. Really, the, the context is how to strengthen our faith in trials as we're journeying to glory in a fallen world that's been subjected to futility and these present sufferings that we go through are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's to be revealed. So how do we, how do we keep journeying and living for God with all these things that will come against us? And that's what this section is about. And we looked at the certainty in verse 28. We know this. As Christians, we know this. Bedrock. We know the extent that God causes all things to work for good in the lives of his children. And we've seen that good is to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. We know this. And this is how we come and worship when our wife's in the hospital. These are the, these are the ways that we know God is working every detail of our lives to shape us into the image of Christ. And we receive from his hand and we trust that hand. And so we need this to be our bedrock promise. And so Paul now is girding that up and strengthening that promise with, with the source and the source is in verse 29 through 30, the grace of God. The grace of God is that he foreknows us, he predestines us, he calls us, justifies and glorifies us. This beautiful definition of grace is how we can be so certain 
that nothing can, can overcome God or cause him not to be working for our good, our own sin, our own weaknesses. Nothing can thwart what God is doing in our lives. And so he wants us to, to be strengthened where we trust this promise. We are those who just walk around and whatever comes into our lives, we're, we're gonna, we might have tears coming down our face, but we trust there's a God who is working to make me into the image of Jesus Christ. And as we we're going to see this morning, he will finish it. And so let's go to the throne of grace and, and pray that every one of us would keep comprehending this in our minds and it gets into our hearts. And so God, I pray for that. I pray we're looking at deep doctrines, eternal doctrines, uh, things that are hard for finite minds to comprehend. <clears throat> but thank you that you've revealed it to us. You've given to us what we needed for life and godliness. And so I pray this morning as we continue looking at it, Lord, that you would strengthen every heart that is a believing heart here this morning. God, that they would see the beauties of grace, that it would overwhelm their hearts, and it would cause them to be able to put their head on this pillow of you working all things for good in their lives. And so, Lord, meet us. I pray if there's any unbelievers worshiping this morning who come uh, seeking. Come, just, I want to know God. I pray this morning that you would answer the cry of that heart, Lord, that you would move through these words and draw some into the kingdom of God, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Verse 29. For, there's our connection. Paul's going to give a, an explanatory what is the purpose of God. <clears throat> the first link in that chain that we looked at is those whom he foreknew, just a beautiful word, and as we dug into it, we, we could probably call that for love. And we saw that God of the universe set his love on you before he even created the world. So it couldn't have been based on how good you are. It has to be just based on the pure freeness of God to set his love upon you. And what we've been learning is when God loves you, look out. <laughs> he does wonderful, amazing things. He expresses his love better than anyone and we are looking at how God unfolds this love that he puts upon people like you and me. And last week we saw that he predestines us. He predestines us to be conformed to the image of his son. He's, he's, he's predetermined that one day you're going to radiate and shine like Jesus Christ from the inside to the outside. He is, he is going to bring that to completion. So he predestined it. And he predestined that we would be the firstborn among many brethren, just being little mirrors, shining, reflecting the glory of Christ back to Christ. And so the whole thing is to put Christ on display, and we're going to do that by our conformity, by the grace of God to Jesus Christ. And those whom he predestined, <coughs> he also called. And so as we looked at foreknew and predestined, all of those took place in eternity past. Those are before the foundation of the world, and now this morning, we're going to move into time. We're going to move into our lifetime, your lifetime. And so we're going from eternity past into now it's getting personal in your day-to-day -day life. And this is how God now takes his eternal purpose, his foreknowledge, and his predestination, and how does he bring it into time and space? And so this now we begin this morning is how does he apply that great purpose from eternity past into our lives today. And I want you to see clearly that he will not leave these huge realities in eternity past, foreknowledge and predestination, to man being determinative of his salvation. He's not going to take this beautiful plan and desire and drop it now in us and depend on us to be smart enough to come to Jesus and figure this out of us being the initiator or the primary cause of our own salvation. God will save. He is mighty to save, cover to cover of Scripture. God will accomplish this big purpose that he designed in eternity past. He will not make us the link in that chain that holds the whole thing together, or it is no chain. Put me in there. You're the weakest link. Break. These will be held together by God. They're going to be held together by his grace which makes them more secure, more trustworthy, and more dependable. You can give your life to this. That's what God is bringing about in this section. 
that we would be disciples and we would lose our lives for King Jesus. And so God must bring into our lives, in a way, this gospel that keeps him sovereign and accomplishing his purposes. And he has done so in a really masterful way. I hope your breath is taken away this morning with how God has decreed to do this. And I, I mean, it wouldn't do us much good to just leave it in the eternal counsels of God in eternity past. This love has got to be worked out. And if you will notice, God will take the first step toward us in history, just like he did in eternity past. And now in history, he must make that first step to bring this salvation to us. He's the determiner of salvation. It's his glory to show forth his free sovereign grace on the ones whom he has foreknown. It's his great glory. When he said, Moses, show me your glory, it's that I'll, I'll have compassion upon whom I'll have compassion, I'll have mercy upon whom I'll have mercy. This is the freeness of God to show this to sinners like you and me. And here's where our battle is. I've talked about it. I'll mention it again. We are the government of the people, to the people, and for the people. Everything in our country is about equal rights, or it used to be, and it's drilled into our heads since birth. And now we want God to run his government the same way. God has to treat everybody the same, or he's not God, is what I hear said a lot. And he, he can't do that. Unless we're the ultimate determiners of our salvation, this can't work. And that is where we fall off a major cliff from what God has revealed in his word and declared to be true in his infallible word. And so it rocks us when God says, does not the potter have the, have the right over the lump of clay to make one for honorable and one for dishonorable use? We don't like things like that. And the answer, he's God. And it's time that we quit making God in our image, an American God. And let the scriptures proclaim a God who sits on the throne of his universe and he does as he pleases and only as he pleases. We'll let God be everywhere except on his throne. If God calls anyone to himself, it is free grace, it was undeserved, and it was unmerited. God calls no one based on their merit. And I just want you to know that is good news because it's the opposite of all religions. Every world religion is God calls you based on your goodness and what you do. This is the only religion that says it had nothing to do with you. If God calls on merit, you can say that's not fair. I deserve it too. But if it's no merit and you're called by God, you can say nothing. If all are condemned on this earth, God is just. If any are saved, it's free sovereign grace, the grace of God. And so if you sit here this morning with faith, God didn't treat you justly. He treated you mercifully. All because he treated his son justly on a cross and he poured out his wrath on his own son on a tree so that instead of you so that he could show you mercy. He was just with his son on that cross so that now he can be merciful to you this morning with the offer of Jesus Christ. So our salvation excludes boasting. I, want, I, I pray you walk out with none except in the cross of Christ. This gospel hum, humbles us at the foot of the cross. God gets all the glory and we get all his grace. And so let's keep journeying this amazing grace and let's take up whom he predestined. These he also called. And I just want to make one observation first. <laughs> this great salvation in eternity past, he says it's going to come to earth and you're going to be justified. And how will you ever be justified? What is the grounds that God can ever declare guilty sinners not guilty? And what we've seen through Romans for a year is the only way is the work of Jesus Christ. And so what is in the way of us being saved? Sin. God's wrath against sin. The holiness of God that demands perfection that we can't give. Ones who don't see the glory and beauty of Christ because we're blinded by the God of this world. And so the work of Jesus Christ 
dealt with our sin, dealt with God's wrath by propitiating it, draining it, and it dealt with the righteousness required by wrapping us in the garment of Jesus Christ. And so that is the grounds of our salvation, the work of Christ. What is the means that we must have then? What is God's means of giving us that salvation? I want to read to you again back in Romans 4, verse 16. For this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace so that the promise will be guaranteed or certain. So the only thing that fits with this grace that we're studying, God doing everything for salvation, is an empty hand. Us looking away from anything in us and looking only to Christ. That is the means. So how can we believe if we're filled with unbelief? That should be every one of our testimonies. We should never have a baptism that doesn't tell you how God brought you to faith, right? I, I was an unbeliever. And God began working in my life, and he brought me to faith to see Jesus Christ as a Savior and altogether beautiful. And so the question is, how do you get faith out of a heart that's faithless? Jesus said, I, I'm, I'm like a mother hen. I want to bring you to myself. But what? You're unwilling. You're stiff-necked. You will not come to me that you might have life. Romans 3, we studied it. There's none who seek for God, none. So if God takes this amazing salvation that he purposed and planned what we've been looking at in eternity past and now leaves that up to us, to whether we figure it out or not, whether we'll receive it or not, that prescient view that we looked at, the golden chain of salvation, <clears throat> no matter how strong all the other links are, it breaks. It breaks bring you in and depend on you and this whole thing falls apart. You don't get justified. And so my question this morning is how does God stay sovereign over this salvation and declare that you are justified before God, declared not guilty by faith alone and make it rock solid so that none of us could ever fall out of grace and never come under condemnation again? How do we do that? He predestined us, and then in time and space, he calls us. And this morning, I want to show you that that call produces a faith in Christ, and that's from God. And this, this faith cannot die, and it cannot be taken away. He will build it and strengthen it the rest of his days. In 1 Peter 1, he says he sticks it in the furnace to purify this faith and keep growing it so that it will make it to the end. And so here's the problem. <clears throat> the scriptures present the call in two different ways. And so context must determine its usage. And here's the way the scriptures use call. There's an internal call and there's an external call of God. And I want to look first at the external call of God. This is what we call the general call. And this is, this is the, the proclamation of the gospel. And it's to go out to all the nations. It's the proclamation that all men everywhere, women and children, are to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to tell everyone and proclaim it and preach it on the highways and byways. But, but shouldn't we only preach to the ones he foreknows and predestines? Who are they? Spurgeon said, if, if there was a, a yellow E on the back of all of God's elect, I'd run around Europe lifting up every shirt. But because there isn't, I lift up Jesus Christ and him crucified and call all men to believe in Jesus Christ and those who are foreknown and predestined will come. They'll be called and their faith will come out from this mass and they'll believe in Jesus Christ. Therefore, we proclaim this to all peoples. Paul, Mr. Romans 9 himself, said in 2 Corinthians 5.20, Therefore, we're ambassadors for Jesus Christ, as though God were entreating through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And we're representing Jesus, calling you, be reconciled to God this morning. Be reconciled, please, I'm begging you, as if God were standing here this morning, calling you, come to Jesus and be saved. So the scriptures are clear. 
we are to give our lives, believers, to this general call. And we're to sow this gospel anywhere and everywhere that we can. Why? Because I can't do the effectual call. I can't make anyone believe. I can't, I can't open any eyes. I can't take stony hearts and give new ones. But I can lift up the cross of Jesus Christ. And so we proclaim it, we announce it, we declare it, we whisper it in ears on deathbeds. We take it anywhere and everywhere, the gospel. In John 7, 37, it says on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried out, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. That's the general call. Anyone thirsting, come to me and drink living water where you'll never thirst again. One of my favorite scriptures, Jesus said this in Matthew eleven twenty five. 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I praise thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou didst hide these things from the wise and intelligent and didst reveal them to babes, the gospel. Yes, Father, for thus it was well-pleasing in thy sight. All things have been handed over to me by the Father, and no one knows the Son <coughs> except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest for your souls. No one's going to get this unless I reveal it to them. And then the general call, come. Come to me, and I'll give you rest for your souls. There's how this all ties so beautifully together. And so here's the problem. Many who hear this universal call never respond to it. I would say, in fact, most. Most in this dead country hear this gospel and never, never, ever surrender their lives to Christ. So my question is, how is it that two people, I've watched this as a pastor many times, and some of you are sitting here this morning, you can grow up in the exact same family, hear the exact same teaching from your mom and dad, your pastors, your Sunday school teachers, and you hear the gospel again and again, and you're all taught the exact same way, and one responds to the gospel call, and the other, the other doesn't. It's the same universal call. Why? Was it you, or was it God that caused you to differ? And this text makes it painfully clear which one it is. Could this text be talking about the universal call of God? And I say, absolutely no way, because all who are called are justified. So anyone who gets this call is justified. So this has to be talking about this, this, this uh, effectual call that I'm going to go over now. It can't be the universal call, because many get that, and they never respond. So I can tell you with absolute certainty, this is not the general call of God. Something more has to happen than just the preaching of the gospel. If anyone will respond to the call of the gospel, will anyone ever respond? And I want you to understand the answer is no, because of total depravity. And we've looked at it in Romans 8, 7. <coughs> the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God. It's not even able to do so. It just loves flesh. It's never going to submit to the call of God to love him and love others. Romans 3.11, there's none who understands. There's none who seeks for God. Listen to 1 Corinthians 2.14. A natural man, an unsaved man, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are morenos to them. It's foolishness to unbelievers. And, and he can't understand them. 2 plus 2 equals 5. I can't get this gospel. I can't see it. It says because they're spiritually appraised. They can hear it forever, but they can't get it. John 6, Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I've said it before, that's the same Greek word in James where it says, is it not the rich who drag you into court? It means grabbing someone by the hair and bringing them in. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him to me. 2 Corinthians 4, 3. <clears throat> if our gospel is veiled as it's being preached, it's veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving 
that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ is the image of God. They can't see it. That's what the gospel lands on. The universal call goes out, and that's what it lands on. Hard soil. That is what our heart has been since the fall in the garden. I always think, would you think it's strange if you walked by a guy with his Bible over a corpse, just saying, man, you got to look at this verse. Have you ever thought about this? And trying to persuade them to believe, you would go, what is wrong with that guy? And that's what we're going out with the universal call. Look, believe in Jesus. Unless there is this effectual call, no one will ever believe. And God planned this beautiful gospel, and no one ever gets it. And that's why God has to do what he's about to do in this text, or none of us would ever come. So here's a key distinction that I want you to get. Anyone who believes will be saved. Anyone who repents and comes to Christ and entrusts themselves to him and receives him will be saved. Whosoever believeth shall not perish but have everlasting life. All who come to me, Jesus said, I will never cast out. All of those are true. But what I want to ask you this morning, tying this together, is who can, who can come? Who can believe? Who can cast themselves upon Christ? John 1.12, But as many as received him, Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And then he continues, though. We usually stop there. Who can do that? Those who were born not of blood, Jewishness, nor of the will of the flesh, free will, nor of the will of man, but of God. The ones who are born of God will receive Jesus. John 3.3, 3, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. And so this is what we call the effectual call of God. Those who are foreknown, they're predestined, and they're called. And this is the call that our text is talking about. Whoever receives this call in our text, what happens? They'll be justified. So this is salvation. What do you need to be justified? We've spent a year on it. Faith. Alone. Apart from the works of the law. So we need faith to be justified in Jesus Christ. And so this call then will grant saving faith to the one who receives it. The one who gets this call is foreknown and predestined. The one who gets this call will be justified and they'll be glorified. This is the the link. And so this call is God causing one to respond to the universal call. Every one of your testimonies, I've heard them. You're sharing how God called you and how he awoke you and what he did to draw you to Jesus Christ. It's only given to those foreknown and predestined. And so don't miss that. God saves through the preaching of his word, the general call. But don't let this doctrine make you say, then why share the gospel? That's a horrible application. It's the means that God has chosen. Our next chapter, Paul says this, (coughs) whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How are they ever going to hear this without the general call? God uses the general call to give his effectual call. And so you you keep preaching, you keep begging. I had someone say, do I just quit sharing then? No, the the reason I share is because God gives an effectual call. I, I don't care how far gone you are. I've had people say, oh, they're just too far gone. No, they're not. The effectual call can come this morning to some of you who have sat in church your whole life. God could this morning let you finally see. And your life is going to be transformed and changed. So what confidence this should bring to our evangelism in God and not us. Don't you love when truth lands on dependent on God and not you? That's when you know you're right. <laughs> God, as I share with anyone and everyone, I, I just... I I know, God, you're the only one who can do this. I can't persuade anyone to see this. I love it. It's given me courage. 
Because it's God who does this. This truth should explode world missions. Go proclaim to all until all are gathered. I was reading about Peter Cameron Scott, (coughs) the founder of the African Inland Mission. And his brother John died and his health was failing, so he returned back to England and he was very depressed and brokenhearted. He went to the Westminster Abbey and he came upon the tomb of the great missionary David Livingston. And David Livingston had a life verse that sent him to the mission field. And it was that Jesus said, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them I also must bring. And so I set my love on other sheep. And the way they're going the to they're gonna be brought into the kingdom is the general call with the effectual call raising their heart. And so God has other sheep all over this world. And that's what sent him into the mission field is because God calls. Without that, probably the dumbest thing you could ever do is go to some place where they've never heard of Jesus, that they've never seen you, and, and what's, how are you going to do anything there? I go to the mission field because I know that God calls and other sheep he has to bring into this fold. And I pray that for Tijuana, Mexico in a few weeks when that church starts up. So some of you may weary with me begging at the end for salvation. Pastor says that every week. (laughs) Yes. You never know when the effectual call will come to one who has sat under it for years. I've watched it again and again. I had one one person who sat under it for 18 years. And then God said, boom, let there be light. I've witnessed it again and again since going into ministry. I never weary of lifting up Jesus Christ and begging you to believe in him that you might have life. So this call is effectual, and it will bring salvation to the one who hears. And this person will come, and this person will believe in Christ, and this person will repent, and he will find in Christ as all and all. That's the mighty call of God, to give corpses life in this gospel. Well, how does this work? Well, I want you to hear the power of God's call. In 1 Corinthians 1.9, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. You were called into this fellowship. Whatever God calls happens. He says, let there be light. And there was. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, the, verse 3, we read it, that the God of this world has blinded the eyes, the mind of the unbelieving, so you can't see the glory of God in Christ. You can't see it. He's blinded you. You can hear it all of your days and never really see the beauty. How can I see How can I finally see Christ as worthy to lose my life for and love and believe and trust? Verse 6, God who said, light shall shine out of darkness. He takes us back to Genesis 1. Light shall shine out of darkness. It's the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. You're just sitting here and he says, let there be light. And all of a sudden, conviction overcomes and and your need of salvation and Christ becomes a savior to you at that moment. So beautiful. Let there be light. And I never get tired of God saying, let there be light. And I never lose hope in anyone because God can say, let there be light any day, any time. And by the way, this evens the playing field because if you were raised by, let's say, uh, a Satan worshiper, or you were raised by a godly mom and dad who taught you the word every day. That's not fair. And it just evens the playing field because there's, both of you can't bring life to either kid or bring death. God could say, let there be light to an atheist or God-hating parent to their kid any day. It's just, you know, everyone says it's not fair. What's, what's not fair is if it's up to you to figure it out, then your upbringing and all your little things you get are better. Gives you advantages. This gives you no advantage except to God who calls, to God be the glory. So here's what happens. Universal call, gospel, it's a call to to come to Christ and love him and trust him and fellowship with him. And then God calls, and you give your life to God instead of your own lusts and your own desires. And what is it that you love, that you want to give your life to, on this gospel's foolishness, and it lands on a corpse. The effectual call, God brings about what he calls for. 
He gives regeneration. He causes you to be born again. You won't see the kingdom unless you are. And he he raises you from the dead. And God (sighs) breathes into you spiritual life. Ezekiel 36, God said, I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit within you. I'll remove the heart of stone and from the flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. And now you're uh, enabled to respond to the gospel. Your mind has been enlightened. Your eyes are open. And your affections are altogether new. And now I want you to hear this, because I'm going to wrinkle some feathers. Now your free will cries, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold or anything that this world affords to me. The freest decision I ever made was to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. God makes you willing, and he calls you, and he opens your eyes, and now you love him, and you believe in him, and you want to follow him. And with your free will, God made you willing. You choose Christ. You choose him. And now you see Christ as that pearl of great price or the treasure hidden in a field, and you'll give up all that you might have him. This call makes us love what we once hated and hate what we once loved. And so what what was once nonsense is now the words of life. What once put you to sleep. Sorry, there's, there's, I, I have so much compassion on this Sunday. You ate turkey for three straight days. And, and some of you are getting the best nap you've ever had. And I'm just with you, okay? Next week, I'll be harder on you, okay? So just go ahead, enjoy your nap, and it's going to be online. But it becomes the words of life. It, it, so much so, you can even enjoy sermons when I preach. <laughs> That's a sign of regeneration. So you repent, and you believe. That's the first fruits of being born again. And I want you to hear this. This is real important now. Ephesians 2.8. For by grace, that's what we've been studying. You've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so no one can boast. And so this very faith is a gift from God. You can't muster it up. If you have faith, you should praise God forever. He gave you this. He called you. When he called you, faith was given to you in that heart. Listen to Philippians 1.29. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his name's sake. It was granted to you to believe. 2 Timothy 2.25. With gentleness, correct those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. Repentance is a gift, faith is a gift, and it all comes out of the call, the call of God that awakens you. And when you see truth, finally, the only thing you can do now is repent for who you are, how you lived, how you thought about God, and to believe in this one that you now see as the pearl of great price. If we're left to ourselves, we would die in our sin, hating God and loving ourselves. That's what would have been right, just. But by the grace of God, I hope this is every testimony. I am what I am. My favorite illustration is the raising of Lazarus. And I really think it was an illustration. Jesus said to her, I'm the resurrection of life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And then he comes to that dead Lazarus in the tomb. And there's a call to Lazarus. And I'm going to tell you, it's the effectual call. He created life in a dead corpse. Because if if I would have said, Lazarus, come forth, nothing would have happened. My general call would have done nothing. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. How could he respond to that call? He had to be given life. And then he could respond. And I was dead in my sins, and God called me forth. And I responded to the call of this gospel. Listen to Acts 2.38. And Peter said to them, Repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> for the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. 
Acts 13, 48, when the Gentiles heard this gospel, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life, believed. Acts 16, 14, a certain woman named Lydia, the beautiful name, from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening to the gospel. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. It gave life, and her heart responded now to the gospel that Paul was preaching. Acts 26, 18, Paul, the calling is going to be to go preach, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. And this one verse, I remember I used to read it and go, what does that mean? And just kept reading. Matthew twenty two fourteen. for many are called, but few are chosen. That's the universal call. Many are called, but few are chosen. Effectual call. First, that's, um, I'm going to run out of time. 2 Timothy 1, 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. <laughs> so for Paul, did Paul ever struggle with who initiated salvation? It's not a real big struggle when you're on a horse and, and you're riding and you're going to go kill anyone who names the name of Jesus. Who initiated salvation? <laughs> the one who knocked him off his horse, and he's like, who are thou, Lord? And he finally realizes, I've been persecuting the, the Lord God, Yahweh, Jesus. Paul knew who initiated salvation. Ephesians 2, 4, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. I'm just going to give you, I'm skipping a whole bunch, sorry, but it, we're going to run out of time. Uh, Donald Gray Barnhouse wrote this. If men heed no more than the outward call, they become members of the visible church. And so this is just people who heard the gospel and they're just in the church they're just nothing more than the visible church. <clears throat> if the inward call is heard in our hearts, we become members of the invisible church, the real church, the ones who are saved. The first call unites us merely to a group of professing members. But the inward call unites us to Christ himself and to all who have been born again. The outward call may bring with it a certain intellectual knowledge of the truth, but the inward call brings us uh, faith from the heart, the hope with, with, which anchors us forever to Christ and the love which must ever draw us back to him who first loved us. The one can end in formalism, the other in true life. The outward call may curb the tendencies of the old nature and keep a soul in outward morality, but the inward call will cure the plague that is in us and bring us on to triumph in Christ. Praise be to God for this inward call. And so I ask you this morning, do you know this call of God? Do you know the universal call or the effectual call? One will just bring you into an external church and you'll just spend a few years here and complain about everything and move on to the next one. But when the internal call comes, man, you're taken up with Jesus Christ. And though you do not see him, you, you love him. And I want you to hear this. The one who is called will be justified because this call will produce faith. And the one then who looks to Jesus Christ in our text will be justified. And we spent a year on that. And to be justified is the God of the universe. This is God looking at you saying you're not guilty. All the guilt and shame that you carry from your life sins the God of the universe, looking right at you now saying, justified. Not, you will be justified right this very second. Justified. Before God, no longer guilty. No longer under condemnation. Now you're under grace and favor.
The one who trampled his law all of your days, guilty before God. The one who could not remove your guilt. You could spend a million years in a monastery and you couldn't remove it. By this gift of faith, by God's grace, we believe the gospel. I'm just going to remind you one more time, quickly. Imputation was the whole key to justification. And we got two T accounts. Many of you have seen it so many times, but I'm going to do it again. Uh, I'm sorry to bar- bother you, Eric, but I'm going to use you. Eric, all of his sin is in this account, past, present, and future. And God takes that sin and he imputes it to Jesus' account and he becomes guilty of every sin that you've ever committed. And he puts him up on a cross and, and it says, he who did not spare his own son, the father pulled out that sword of justice and he punished his own son for three hours. And those nails were, were nothing to Jesus kept his mouth silent, and finally he could no longer keep it in. And he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because I'm bearing the wrath of God, and I'm, I'm, I'm being separated from the Father. I'm just his wrath is wave after wave. What I would have had to pay in hell forever, he's draining the cup for all of his children right there, all his brethren. And he's bearing it. So that now your sins, what, why? Why? My God, my God, why is thou forsaken me? So that I can give mercy to Eric for all that he's committed and all that he's ever, every sin paid, separated as far as the east is from the west. And I want you to hear this. God's saying, I remember your sins no more. You, you remember them. God says, I don't even remember them anymore. They're, they're, they're often forgetfulness. Every sin. Jesus bore on that cross in your place. And then he says, I'm, I'll take the righteousness of Jesus Christ who came and lived the perfect life that God requires. To be in his presence, you've got to be perfect. And God says, I'll take that life. This is my son in who I'm well pleased. And I'll get to my it into your account. So that when God looks at you now, he sees the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. God looks at you this morning as if you live the life that Jesus lived by faith. And not by you working and coming to church and cleaning yourself up but by looking to this Christ alone. And the one who has that is justified. Not guilty before God. We should be dancing. And those ones he'll glorify. And when we receive our resurrected bodies that we've been learning in Romans 8, I'm just going to throw out a few things. We're going to be heirs with God, heirs of God, Join heirs with Christ, a redeemed creation, new bodies made perfect, perfect fellowship with the saints forever in God, living in perfect love for all of eternity, just being put on display and glorified before us for all of eternity, marital bliss with Christ. No threat of sin, the devil, this world system for all of eternity, those things are done. No more death and sorrow and sickness and all these things will be wiped away. But the essence of what we saw last week is you'll be conformed to Jesus Christ. That's what God predestined, and that's how this is going to end. You're going to shine like Jesus Christ for all of eternity. And then I, I think a pie is better than Jesus. <laughs> You're going to shine like Christ for all of eternity because God set his love on you before the foundation of the world. And because he loved you, he predestined you to this end, to be conformed to his son. And then he sent his son into the world to do what was necessary for our salvation. And then in time and space, he called you. You would have been a dead moralist, hater of God all of your days. And the God of the universe drew you to Jesus Christ. He awakened you to where Jesus became beautiful, a savior. I believe in him. No longer raised in church, just nodding your head. It became the words of life. And those whom he called, he justified. Accepted before God, adopted into his family. And the ones he justifies, he will glorify. Nothing will stop it because it's the chain of grace. You can't stop it. The devil can't stop it. I just want you to be overwhelmed with that. If he justifies you, glorifies you. 
And we've talked about this many times, but the word, every one of these words are in these little heiress snapshot past tense. And, and I expect glorified to be in the future tense because he's going to glorify us in the future. And Paul doesn't make mistakes because he's inspired by the Holy Spirit and he chooses that crazy heiress tense. Our glorification's in the future. But the, but, but the past tense is inspired by God and it's breathtaking. You are glorified. James Denny said the tense in this last word is amazing, the most daring anticipation of faith that even the New Testament contains. It's done. You're glorified. As you sit here this morning, it's certain because it's the, it's the chain of grace. It's, it, it started with four no, and there's nothing that can break it. You're glorified in the eyes of God because nothing can stop it. Be overwhelmed with that. I'm going to be glorified because of God. <laughs> Thank you. Woo! Glorification, it's already done because of the divine decree of God. The future in our experience. This final link in the chain of grace is absolutely certain. God has called you. He will glorify you. No one falls out of the chain of grace. He doesn't just offer salvation. He saves you. You shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. Jesus saves, and I want you to hear Jesus in John 6. All that the Father gives me, those ones I foreknew, shall come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. What a promise. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, my Father. And this is the will of him who sent me that of all that he has given me, all these ones he foreknew, I'll lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. I'll lose none of them. I'll raise them up. And so do you see why Paul could make such an all-encompassing statement? And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who have been called according to his purpose pray that we would live lives recklessly abandoned to this truth. This is the pillow for a heavy heart, and some of you have heavy hearts. And I want to be a church that stands and lives upon this massive, massive promise of God, to be steadfast and unmoved in every high and stormy gale that comes into our lives. And I'll tell you as a pastor, I am overwhelmed with how much has been coming into this church, and I'm just watching every one of you praise God and trust him. Sometimes tears coming down, but it's overwhelming me that you're, you're anchoring your life on that promise. And we give him all the glory for that. I've never seen anything like it. No matter what's come into your lives, you're trusting God. So beautiful. So grace is not just an offer to save. It's God's power to save to the uttermost all who draw near to God through Jesus Christ. He, he's mighty to save, amen? I'm going to keep you a few extra minutes, okay? Blame it on, let's say, the baptisms and the advent. But I, I, would, I would do both again. So we're going to go just a few minutes longer. Amen? I'll, I think I'll do this one another day. Why doesn't he mention sanctification? I'll try to bring that in next time. That's a big answer. So here's another question. I want you to answer this this morning. I want you to, do you sit here going, you know, I was, I was drowning in an ocean. God threw out a life preserver, John 3.16, and I grabbed it. <laughs> and I am saved. I'm going to heaven. Or were you dead at the bottom of the ocean? <laughs> dead. No hope of rescue. And God's son dove in. And he rescued you and he did CPR and brought you to life. And he died while he was saving you on that mission. Which one are you? Maybe that's why all this just is cold. Because it was just something little simple. I, I grabbed that life raft. I was smart enough. I, I just knew. My brother Jim, he, he, didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't as smart as me. And that, that's why. And, and, and that's why you're stuck. 
I want you to look this morning. Were you dead? At the bottom of an ocean. And God himself came and rescued you and has given you life out of death. When that happens, man, you, you love him and you treasure him and you never get over it. I, I wasn't smart enough to grab a... I was splashing them. <laughs> God, save souls. Next, hard times are coming, and they have come. And this text gives us freedom not to be consumed by our problems, but to keep loving God and others. You remember Romans 8, 4, the fulfillment of the law is to love God and love others. How do I do that? when I live in a world that is so difficult and so many things are coming against me and the futility, how do I do that? I'm so consumed with myself, my problems, all that I'm going through. Who's got time to love anybody? And this promise sets you free to love because everything that's coming at me is God working for my good. And I can keep loving other people because I'm just safe in God's purpose and plan and what he's doing. And so even when I'm dying and empty and all I'm going through, I still can love because he first loved me. Next. This, this hit me hard. Your biggest problem you face this morning is not your circumstances. Who in the world would say such a dumb thing? Your biggest problem is not your circumstances. Your biggest problem is your character. God is, is working together for good with your circumstances to make you like Jesus Christ, to conform the things that are not like Jesus Christ. And so your greatest need is to become like Jesus Christ, not a change of circumstances. God brings the circumstances. He's using them to change your character. And so do I spend all my time trying to get rid of the circumstances? Or, oh God, use these circumstances to make me into the image of Jesus Christ. That's your greatest need, conformity to Christ. Three thoughts that jumped at me. God works all things for our good. I want you to love that. And then the good things that you have can't be taken away. His love, he's justified you, he's adopted you. And then the third is that the best things are yet to come. He's going to glorify you. This passage tells me much. Romans 8.28 is not the promise of better life circumstances. It's the promise of a better life. These he glorified. And what's coming at the end of this forever is a better life. That's what this promise is. Next, nothing can separate us from this chain of grace. Once God sets his love on you, nothing can break this. I love being loved by God. God's love has caused him to do all that is necessary for my eternal good and his glory. And then my last thought, how do I know if I'm foreknown? How do I know if I'm predestined? Do I, do I need to go find the book of life and flip it around and see if my name's in it. it just it doesn't, You're not going to be able to see that. God doesn't leave that in Jerusalem and you go and look it up. How do, how do I know if God set his love on me? The answer, do you see Jesus as glorious? That veil's been opened and I see the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ. You see that he is able to save sinners who will come to him and believe in him. You see that. That he's done everything necessary for you to be saved. Te telestai, it is finished. And you believe that. You believe in him and him alone. Not I'm going to add a few other religions and hope it all works out. I believe in him and him alone. And Peter said, if, if you, though you don't see him, you love him. And that's how you know when God calls you, you believe and you love Christ. And if you love me, keep my commandments. I want to obey him. And then you're the elect of God. That's how you know. You can't settle this doctrine without Jesus. Okay? I spent five years trying to figure it out without Jesus. It doesn't work. 
The gospel is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. That's why chapter 8 and 9 come after this Romans 1 through 5. You're justified by faith in Christ alone. That's what you do. You believe in that and you're justified. So this morning I just ask you as the Christmas season, that call is let us receive him. Have I received him? Will you have him this morning to be your savior and to rule over your life? Even if election is true, will you have this Christ? I've had some tell me I I can never believe in a God that elects. That's a bad place to start. Instead of saying, does the Bible say there's a God who elects? That's where I start. And so I just ask you, have you received this Christ Or have you lived under a general call all of your days, just religious? I want so much more. Christ stood up and he said, come, drink this living water, eat this bread and you'll have life. Come to me. Come to me is the call. And you just stopped at at religion. There's So much more that he offers to you. And I, I pray that you've received that effectual call. And therefore you've come to this Christ and you believe in him and you love him. You're not just playing games, religious little games on Sundays. God isn't going to hold up on the last day. So I offer Jesus Christ to you this morning. Come to Christ and be saved. Father, I come before you and I thank you for this beautiful passage. Lord, I marvel, I marvel, I marvel at grace. And Lord, I pray that every heart is just stunned at what you've said in these five golden chains. Lord, we give you all the glory. We thank you, we love you, and we praise you. And I pray, God, that you meet us here in this Christmas season. And I pray that some would let the Christ come in. Lord, that you would knock. You would knock on hearts. That you would call some with the effectual call, even sitting here this morning. God, that they would realize they need Christ and be done with dead religion. God, I pray for their souls this morning. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.